Hello and welcome to Obscure History. Today's video will be continuing the ongoing series on the Seleucid Empire as we delve into the life and times of the successor to Antiochus II Theos, Seleucus II Callinicus. But before we get started, I'd like to make a quick announcement. If you happen to follow the channel closely, you would have noticed the lack of uploaded content as of late. This is mostly due to the fact that I got married and went on the following honeymoon. The last month has been an absolute blast and I could not be any happier, but I've been aware that I've left my viewers on quite the cliffhanger with the demise of Antiochus II Theos. I plan on rectifying this by, you guessed it, releasing the next video on the Seleucids, picking up right where we left off. So join me if you will, as we dive back into the Hellenistic world and introduce ourselves to Seleucus II Callinicus. Born in the year 265 BC, Seleucus was born in the capital of Antioch on the Orontes in Syria. He was the eldest child to be born out of the union between Antiochus II and Laodice I. He had one younger brother named Antiochus, who will play an integral part in the reign of his sibling, for reasons that will become very clear as we move forward. The other three siblings were named Aparma, Stratoniki, and Laodice. As the oldest son of Antiochus II, Seleucus's path to power should have been very straightforward, provided he was deemed worthy enough of the task. As we have already discussed, however, his father had taken another queen, Berenike of Egypt, to secure what was meant to be a lasting peace between the houses of Ptolemy and Seleucus. With the birth of Berenike's son, Antiochus, the Vasileus had effectively alienated his existing family, thus unnecessarily creating a tense familial situation. Whilst not entirely disowned, Seleucus would move to Ephesus as a teenager, along with his mother Laodice and younger brother Antiochus. Presumably, his three sisters was also with them. Being located on the western coast of Anatolia, Ephesus provided a base for Laodice and her family, which would have given them easy access to make a hasty escape should agents be sent against them. This proved not to come to pass, as Antiochus Theos had effectively abandoned Berenike and their young son in all but name to live with his original family for the last few years of his reign. What you see on screen is the great ruins of the amphitheatre at Ephesus. By doing this, Antiochus Theos was with his preferred family, whilst not technically breaking the terms of the treaty with Egypt, as he never divorced Berenike. But the new pharaoh, Ptolemy III Eurygetes, the benefactor, did not see it this way. To him, Antiochus had left his rightful queen, and so demanded that he return to her if the peace was to continue. But before he could depart for Syria, he died. With the probable murder of Antiochus Theos under Laodice's watch, she continued to champion her family's right to the empire by immediately proclaiming Seleucus to be the rightful king at 18 years of age. At the same time, the widowed queen Bernike proclaimed her infant son Antiochus to be the rightful ruler in Antioch. At first, Bernike was able to act decisively by seizing control of Syria and Cilicia. In doing this, she blocked the main roadways leading into Syria from Anatolia. To back her son's claims to the empire, she sent word of the transpiring unrest in Syria to her brother Ptolemy III in Egypt. The pharaoh assembled his forces and marched northwards along the Levantine coast with all haste to support his sister's cause, inaugurating the beginning of the Third Syrian War. This war has also been dubbed the Laodicean War after Seleucus's own mother. Most of the cities in Seleucid-controlled Anatolia supported the ascension of Seleucus as Vasileus. Here we are then, the first Seleucid civil war, but certainly not the last. 
Whilst no longer technically queen of the realm, Lauda Kay still had deep pockets as well as many friends within the Seleucid court. In order to secure her family's future in power, agents loyal to Lauda Kay and Seleucus were dispatched to Antioch. There they were able to isolate the widowed queen Berenike and the child Antiochus, and had mother and son put to death. Capturing the key port of Seleucia at Piraea, Ptolemy III marched on Antioch itself, still oblivious to the murders of his sister and nephew. It was not until after the capture of Antioch that Ptolemy learned of their fates. Grieving for his losses, Ptolemy nonetheless continued his hostile takeover of Seleucid lands. By the end of 246 BC, he had marched along the Euphrates River, arriving in Babylon where he wintered there. At the same time, a Ptolemaic fleet was dispatched into the Aegean Sea, where it was able to capture Ephesus and the few cities held by the Seleucids in Thrace. Meanwhile, Seleucus II had not been idle. He managed to assemble his own fleet to help him retake Cilicia and Syria, but was unfortunate enough to have his fleet wrecked in a storm. Unlucky would be an understatement for the new Seleucid monarch but all was not completely hopeless. Looking for allies to shore up his position, Seleucus turned to Mithridates II of Pontus for an alliance. In return for marrying his sister Laodice to the Pontic ruler, the region of Phrygia was given to the Seleucids as a marriage gift. He also married another sister to the ruler of Cappadocia, Ariarathes III, and so, on the diplomatic stage, he was much more successful. At around the same time, he also married his first and only wife, Laodice II. According to Polybius, this Laodice was the daughter of Andromachus, who was the son of Achaeus. If you will recall, Achaeus was the brother of Seleucus I, making this Laodice the aunt of Seleucus II. If there could be one key takeaway after researching the Hellenistic monarchies, it has to be their interesting family ties. With Ptolemy busy in Babylon, Seleucus II assigned his younger brother Antiochus as viceroy of Anatolia before marching away with his army. The coins here depict Seleucus on the left and Ptolemy on the right respectively. By February of 245 BC, Ptolemy had left Mesopotamia at the news of Seleucus's crossing of the Taurus Mountains into Syria after he retook Cilicia. Not wanting to be cut off, he was able to return home as news of unrest in Egypt also reached the pharaoh. Whilst little information is available as to the nature of this unrest, we know that it would be the first of many revolts that the Ptolemies would have to face during their rule in Egypt. It seems that high taxes were levied on the native Egyptian populace in order to finance the Third Syrian War, and surviving papyri indicates that the usual flooding patterns of the Nile River had failed for a few consecutive years, which we now understand to be due to increased volcanic activity. Naturally, this resulted in less food being widely available and would surely be a point of contention for the native Egyptians. Regardless of the unrest, Ptolemy returned to Egypt with 40,000 talents of gold and Egyptian statues reputed to have been looted by the Persians centuries ago when they took over Egypt. Back in Syria, Seleucus was able to recapture Antioch and most of Syria. He was also able to re-secure Mesopotamia, possibly defeating a Ptolemaic governor left behind in Babylon. For these actions, he was given the name Callinicus, meaning beautifully triumphant. He was also known unofficially as Pogon, the Bearded, which he earned later on in life. Once his position was secure enough, Seleucus even began launching minor raids into Ptolemaic-held Syria and the lands around Damascus. By 241 BC, peace had finally been concluded between the two sides. Ptolemy Eurogetes recognized Seleucus Callinicus as king, and the borders in Syria were restored to their pre-war state. At least for the most part, that is. For you see, Ptolemy had the upper hand in the negotiations, so he kept hold of Ephesus in Anatolia, and the cities taken in Thrace and around the Hellespont which the Seleucids once held. 
most humiliatingly of all, the important city of Seleucia at Piraea was to remain under Ptolemaic possession. Not only was the city on the doorstep of Antioch and was a vital trading hub for the empire, it also contained the burial place of the empire's founder, Seleucus I. This last peace term would be one of the major causes for the eventual Fourth Syrian War, but that would be getting ahead of ourselves. For now, the Ptolemies would find their kingdom at its absolute peak, but unfortunately the same could not be said for the Seleucids. Seleucus would have other problems to deal with, as the Seleucid possessions in Anatolia had raised in revolt against their rightful Vassileus. The events that transpired in Anatolia which led to the revolt can be pinpointed to one figure. Antiochus, the king's own younger brother, had decided he could no longer be content with his already cushy position as viceroy of Anatolia. Ancient sources state that his mother, Laodice, fully supported the revolt of the younger Seleucid prince, perhaps even the instigator that pushed him to take such a brash action. Whilst I believe Laodice had some role which contributed to the revolt, I do not think she was the instigator of it. His mother's influence and connections would certainly help lend gravitas to his cause, but Antiochus's later activities shows us that he was certainly capable and ambitious enough to act in his own interests. With that said, I believe it was always his own intention to declare himself king. After all, how else would history remember you with the nickname Hyrax, the Hawk? This tetradrachma on screen depicts none other than the Hawk himself, wearing the wings of Hermes. This single act of defiance would further tarnish the Seleucid name, as the next 17 years of Seleucus' rule would be spent trying on and off to bring his rebellious brother down. In the same year of 241 BC, Seleucus marched over the Taurus Mountains into Anatolia, where he marched to Sardis, which the Hawk had made his capital. Nearing the vicinity of Sardis, the historian Eusebius, writing in the 3rd century AD, mentions Seleucus fought a successful battle against Hyrax, but that this engagement was not decisive, as the forces of the Hawk were able to retreat inside the city. After an unsuccessful two-year siege, the two brothers would meet near the settlement of Ancyra, further inland in 239 BC. Before the brothers met on the battlefield, Hyrax was able to persuade Mithridates II of Pontus, Arsimes I of Armenia, and Ariarathes III of Cappadocia to lend military support. All these monarchs knew they would be better off if the Seleucids remained divided. Hyrax also turned to a group of people who have made a prior appearance in our coverage of the Seleucids. I am referring to the Celtic Galatians. As I have mentioned before, the Galatians never went away after their defeat at the hands of Antiochus I Soter, and they would lend their fierce warrior reputation to anyone who was interested. For the right price, of course. It seems that Hyrax was able to pay this price, for he had the backing of many Galatian warriors at the Battle of Ancyra. Details regarding the Battle of Ancyra are very scarce, which is a real shame given the importance of it. All we know is that with the help of his Grand Coalition, Hyrax was able to soundly defeat Seleucus, who had lost around 20,000 men at arms. Barely escaping this catastrophe with his life, Seleucus skulked back over to Syria, where he had no choice but to accept the independence of his brother. Content with leaving the core territories of the Empire to Seleucus, the Hawk made himself master of all the Seleucid possessions west of the Taurus Mountains. An uneasy peace soon developed between the two brothers, but an official peace does not seem to have actually been declared during this time. We will leave the Hawk be for now, as Seleucus began mustering the resources of his slowly unravelling empire to face the latest threat in the east from a new rebellion. This time, it was headed by the satrap of Parthia, Andragoras. 
While Seleucus was busy dealing with the Ptolemies and the revolt of Hyrax, Androgoras proclaimed himself an independent ruler based in his satrapy of Parthia by the year of 245 BC. Interestingly, he seems to not go as far as declaring himself king as surviving coins minted under him merely have his name and are curiously missing the title of Vasileus. To Androgoras, it must have seemed the perfect time to break away from the Seleucid state. However, at around the same time, a nomadic people appeared on the doorstep of the Hellenistic world. Enter the Parni. The Parni people descended from Central Asia and began raiding the Parthian satrapy in earnest. These Parni nomads were led by their leader Arsakis, who would in time go on to found his own kingdom. Androgoras soon quickly realised the great difficulties of holding back the new arrivals. He could not have timed his revolt any worse, even had he tried. Burning his bridges with a Seleucid king and court proved to be a shot in the foot with an arrow. Without Seleucid military backing, Androgoras had too few resources to hold his position. At first, the northern region of Parthia, Astabini, fell to the nomads. Not long after that, the Parni moved further south and occupied the rest of the satrapy, killing Androgoras in the process. So much for his revolt. Even the settlements lucky enough to house ex-Seleucid garrison troops were soon wiped out by the invaders. All the while, Seleucus began marching a fresh army eastward towards Parthia in 238 BC to put an end to the rebellion. Unbeknown to him, however, the Parni had taken care of the rebel satrap, but they were not going to simply hand over their newly acquired lands back to the Seleucids. Sources differ on what happened during Seleucus's foray into Parthia. Some, such as the Roman historian Justin writing in the mid-3rd century AD, tells us that the Parni had also overrun the region of Hyrcania before meeting the Seleucid forces in battle, after which Seleucus II suffered a heavy defeat. Others suggest that Seleucus simply retreated in the face of overwhelming numbers. If a battle did take place, then Justin gives no details of it. He does however give us a detailed account of how the Parni waged war. To quote him directly, they fight on horseback, either galloping forward or turning their backs. Often too, they will counterfeit flight, that they may throw their pursuers off their guard against being wounded by their arrows. The signal for battle among them is given, not by trumpet, but by drum. Nor are they able to fight long, but they would be irresistible, if their vigour and perseverance were equal to the fury of their onset. In general, they retire before the enemy, in the very heat of the engagement, and soon after their retreat, return to the battle afresh, so that, when you feel most certain that you have conquered them, you have still to meet the greatest danger from them. The description Justin provides us of the Parni way of warfare can give us a good portrayal of how they would have defeated the Seleucids in open battle. Drawing their foe in whilst maintaining their distance, the Parni would use the standard nomadic practice of utilising their horse archers to pepper the enemy with arrows before retreating away. During the retreat, they would employ the famous Parthian shot, that is, spinning a full 180 whilst the horse was riding away and firing repeatedly into the enemy ranks during the retreat. But this retreat was a trick, for the enemy would think that they had won the day, but in actuality, the horse archers would use fresh mounts to return to the fight, where they would simply rinse and repeat the process as before. The Parni also employed cataphractos, which in Greek literally means something like armoured warrior. These warriors would also be mounted on horseback, with both rider and horse clad almost head to toe in heavy chainmail armour. These mobile shock troops would be used to break up entire formations of infantry. The archers would then take advantage of the gaps formed, raining further destruction on their foes. I am only giving a very brief overview for the purposes of this discussion, but know that the combination of these two mobile troop types working in tandem 
could have devastating effects on less maneuverable armies. We can therefore begin to understand how a horse-based Parni army could go up against the heavy infantry units of the Hellenistic world. As we know, the Seleucids would make extensive use of their phalangites up to this point as that was the way war was conducted since the days of the Diadochi and Alexander. The phalangites weighed down by their heavier armour and pikes could do little against the barrage of arrows. Hellenistic horsemen tended to travel quite lightly. They were certainly not on the same level as the cataphractos, so any countercharge would have been more or less hopeless. Given all this, the fighting would have been fairly one-sided against the Lucas, as he was expecting to go up against a similar phalanx-based army under Andragoras, but it was not meant to be. Justin also states that the Parni saw their victory over the Seleucids on this occasion as the official beginnings of the Parthian Kingdom. From now on, I will be referring to them as the Parthians. Arsakis would lend his name to the new Parthian dynasty, the Arsakids, and his descendants would go on to build on his kingdom and turn it into an empire that would keep chipping away at Seleucid territory until it came face to face with Rome. The Seleucids would adopt their military to meet this new style of warfare, employing lighter troop types to better fend off against horse archers, and even deploying the use of their own cataphractos, but these reforms would be seen after Seleucus II's time, although I do have a thought on this which I will get to later on. Personally, I'm inclined to agree with the likes of Justin, as another heavy defeat would explain Seleucus's reluctance to immediately continue his war with Hyrax in Anatolia, or to continue the offensive in Parthia. It is also at around this time that Diodotus II became the ruler of Bactria, following his father's death of natural causes. Hearing of the flight of Seleucus, he arranged an alliance with the Parthians to act as a buffer between the empire and his own territory. This policy was in contrast to his fathers, who pursued tough measures against the expansion of the Parthians. It would also be left to Diodotus II to officially break any remaining ties with the House of Seleucus. Another interesting area to note is the region of Persis to the south. During the days of Seleucus I, Persis had been under direct Seleucid control, but it was during under Antiochus I or II that the region became semi-autonomous under native governorship, known as the Fratarakas. This name was a Persian title which literally meant governor or sub satrapal governor. These Fratarakas were originally thought to have split from the Seleucids through violent means. However, after recent studies were carried out, this breakaway seems to have been somewhat peaceful in comparison to other regions like Parthia and Bactria. Whilst somewhat regaining their independence, the Fratarakas are now seen as the representatives of the Seleucids in the region of Persis. It seems the position of Fratarakka was passed down from one family member to the other, of which there were several, effectively creating a mini-dynasty. We once again find ourselves turning to surviving numismatics for much of the info we have on them. The Fratarakas produced a series of very interesting silver coins with mixed Hellenistic and Persian iconography and motifs. A clear example of this can be seen with the busts of the ruling Fratarakka. The headpiece worn is a clear cross between the traditional Persian style of satrapal tiara and a Hellenistic diadem on the obverse. The reverse of these drachma will typically depict the Zoroastrian worship of Ahura Mazda through fire worship. Before the lightning conquest of Alexander the Great, the Achaemenid Persians utilized gold and silver coins, but these were mostly concentrated in the western parts of their empire. This was because the Greeks made widespread use of coins, and the Persians would mint their own in order to finance Greek factions that aligned with them and to pay for Greek mercenaries. The further east a traveller went, the more they would notice that bartering was more commonplace when making daily transactions. Bartering would persist long after the fall of the Seleucids, but they did help to facilitate a more monetized society 
throughout the Middle East. There can be no mistake that the coins minted under the Fratarakas were clearly modelled directly on the ones produced by their Seleucid overlords. Moving back to our narrative, we find ourselves in Anatolia, where Antiochus Hyrax had been busy attempting to satisfy his ambitions. Following his resounding victory at Ancyra in 239 BC, the Hawk felt confident enough to attempt a further expansion of his domains. Not long after the clash at Ancyra, Antiochus took his Galatian host through Phrygia, where he extorted a number of settlements of their wealth. Indeed, even Hyrax himself had to flee on multiple instances from his supposed allies due to their unpredictable and violent nature. Once order was re-established, the Hawk proceeded to the city of Pergamon, near the Ionian coast, where he felt confident in taking on the new lord of Pergamon. Enter Attalus I. If the Hawk thought Pergamon would be easy pickings, then he was about to get a seriously rude awakening. Taking the reins of power from his cousin Eumenes I in 241 BC, Attalus took stock of the situation. Around him, Seleucid authority had been severely weakened from all the infighting, with the real possibility to expand his influence being too much to pass over. Attalus would not be content like his predecessor to hold on to just Pergamon alone. Thus, his strategy against Hyrax was simple. He would fight ambition with ambition. Sallying out with his forces, Attalus and the Hawk met at the Battle of Aphrodisium in 238 BC. Virtually nothing is known about the fighting, but we can imagine the Galatians fighting vigorously to earn their pay. Despite the backing of these fearsome warriors, Hyrax suffered defeat at the hands of Attalus. Other battles between the two were fought afterwards throughout the 230s, each time Attalus was left the victor. For his victories against the Galatians, Attalus was awarded the name Sota, the Saviour, and he upgraded his title from Lord to King of Pergamon. No longer welcomed by any of the cities in Anatolia, and the Galatians abandoning him by this point, Hyrax attempted to launch an invasion of Mesopotamia whilst his brother was busy in the east, leaving his Anatolian possessions to be absorbed mostly by Attalus. Luckily for Seleucus, the Hawk's advance was halted by his father-in-law, named Achaeus, who managed to destroy his remaining forces. That or they decided enough was enough, and they deserted the Hawk once and for all. After this debacle, Hyrax fled to the court of Ariarathes III and his sister Queen Stratoniki in Cappadocia. As former allies against Seleucus, Antiochus had hoped to use that fact to take shelter amongst friends, but he was gravely mistaken. After escaping an assassination attempt by his former allies, the Hawk fled Asia altogether to Thrace in an attempt to escape the agents of Attalus and his brother. Attempting to seek asylum with the Ptolemaic troops there, he was immediately arrested on the spot. Miraculously, only after a short time the Hawk somehow escaped his captivity and began wandering the countryside of Thrace. By 226 BC, his luck had finally run out when a group of Celts had him mercilessly killed. According to Philarchus, another Greek historian writing in the 3rd century BC, Hyrax was not remembered fondly by his subjects, but at least his horse honoured his memory. When the Celtic chief responsible for his death mounted the horse, it is said it bolted off a nearby cliff, killing both animal and rider, and avenging its former master. Whilst this may or may not be fictitious, it can certainly be said that the troublesome brother of Seleucus was a hawk to the very end. The statue you can see on screen, by the way, is known as the Dying Gaul. This piece is a Roman copy of an older Greek sculpture that was commissioned by Attalus I following his victory over the Galatians, led by Hyrax. When he returned to the West, Seleucus was the ruler of a much reduced empire, certainly when we compare it to the one his father had reigned over. Whilst away, his mother Laodice I had met her end when she was captured by Ptolemy III. 
Knowing who gave the orders to have his family murdered, Ptolemy had little issue in executing the troublesome Seleucid matriarch. This should have naturally prompted an immediate response from Seleucus to avenge her death, but the resources of the empire needed time to recover. Personally, Seleucus was probably still annoyed that her mother supported her other son in his revolt against him. I know I would be. Now in Syria, he had little time to rest, as a new revolt in Antioch had erupted. This time, the unrest was instigated by his aunt, Queen Stratoniki of Macedon, who had been married to Demetrius II Aetolicus before taking on a new wife. Stratoniki pleaded with Seleucus, trying to convince him to either enter in a marriage with her or to exact revenge against Demetrius. Fed up of listening to these suggestions, Seleucus refused to listen any further. Stratoniki responded with a short-lived revolt in Antioch, which Seleucus had to besiege the city to end. Stratoniki attempted to escape to Seleucia at Piraea into Ptolemy's possession, but she was captured and killed before this could happen. Despite the much-depleted resources of his reduced empire and the most recent unrest at the capital, he began a grand expansion of Antioch. A nearby island would be the foundation for a third walled city which would be connected to the existing site. By 227 BC, Seleucus had stabilised his position enough to begin drafting up plans to take back the lands lost in Anatolia. In 226 BC, a massive earthquake hit the island of Rhodes, resulting in mass destruction, including the toppling of the famous Colossus of Rhodes. Seleucus II sent relief to the beleaguered island by gifting the Rhodians 10 fully equipped war vessels, 200,000 medimni of corn, 10,000 cubits of timber, and 1,000 talents of hair and resin. He also exempted all Rhodians trading throughout his domains of custom taxes. We can also read from surviving Mesopotamian inscriptions that Seleucus continued the familial practice of patronising the religious orders of Babylon throughout his busy reign. This text refers to a letter sent from the king himself to the chief administrator of the sanctuary of Ezekiel. The contents confirm Seleucus's support of Babylonian religious rites as well as his close friendship with the administrator. The 40-year-old Vasileus and his army were mostly ready by 225 BC to restore Seleucid control over Anatolia. However, the invasion preparations came to a screeching halt when Seleucus II was riding on a horse one day when he fell and snapped his neck, killing him instantly. The reign of Seleucus II Callinicus can be certainly seen as a tumultuous time for the empire. Civil unrest was the order of things from his ascension as king. Most modern scholars consider this Seleucus to be an abject failure compared to his great-grandfather and namesake. It is hard not to blame Seleucus Callinicus for the contraction of the empire's fortunes and territory, but I believe most of these factors were beyond his control. For example, his father Antiochus II Theos contributed greatly to the events that followed after his death, doing zero favours for his son. Had a smooth transition to power happened, it is unlikely the Ptolemies would have invaded, and thus the chances of Hyrax and the easternmost satrapies revolting would have been reduced significantly, as the lands Seleucus controlled would have been more united to face any threat. In terms of the resources he had to work with, he was hampered at every stage of his reign. With significant chunks of the empire breaking away from central authority, Seleucus was never able to fully pull the potential manpower and finances to bear on any given problem. His failure to decisively deal with his brother was a tremendous waste of these resources, an issue that should never have materialised and one that could have been avoided. Still, he was able to somewhat confine that problem to the other side of the Taurus Mountains, and he was a popular enough ruler as to not invite the complete takeover of the whole empire by Hyrax. Most modern scholars point to Seleucus's failure to retake the satrapies of Parthia and Hyrcania to demonstrate his incompetence. Whilst an argument could be made for that, the truth is far more complex as it often is. 
As I explained before, Seleucus thought he would be going up against the rebel Seleucid troops of the region under Andragoras. Reasonably then, he assumed the fighting would be done with similar troop types. The Parni invasion must have come as a complete shock to the Seleucid ruler when he saw the horde of horse-riding nomads approaching over the horizon, a shock that his army was ill-equipped to handle. I mentioned that the Seleucid army would somewhat adapt to the harsh new realities of this new style of warfare after Seleucus II's time. As we will see, Seleucus's eventual successor would employ the use of cataphractos and lighter armed troops in the army, but I would like to propose that at the very least, the beginnings of these military reforms began to take shape at the end of Seleucus II's reign. This would make sense as it would take some time to obtain the new equipment needed, as well as to arm and train the troops in the new tactics of warfare. With all that said, it seems ironic that Seleucus would use the title of beautifully triumphant, given his mixed military track record. Perhaps he should have just stuck to Pogon, the bearded. Thank you for watching part 4 of our dive into the Hellenistic Seleucid Empire. In the next video of this series, we will cover the successors of Seleucus II Callinicus, firstly through the short-lived reign of his oldest son Alexander, who will take up the regnal name of Seleucus III Carinus. From there, we will move on to the first half of his successor's reign, the younger son of Seleucus II, Antiochus III, who in time would earn himself the nickname Megas, the Great. If you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like and perhaps a comment. Until next time, this has been Obscure History.